I get on average like five resumes a week. And this is one thing that happens a ton is resumes are sent to me as a Word doc. And the reason why I'm pretty against that is because Word docs are editable first off. So someone can edit your resume and let's be honest too, we're all using different technologies. So if someone's looking at your Word doc resume on maybe their cell phone while they're waiting to get groceries put in their car at ATB, or they're looking at it on a MacBook, but you worked on it on a Lenovo, et cetera, it's gonna format differently. So the only way to really save your formatting that you've worked really hard on is to make sure you send it as a PDF. And it's just kind of the golden rule to follow is to send all um, career or hiring applications, et cetera, as PDFs because that way it saves correctly and is not editable. Um, third item, we have good old Nick Jonas right there. I wanted to make sure I know we have, we're talking about LinkedIn in a little bit, but just making sure that your headshot photo, whether that's on LinkedIn uh, or other, any other internal Oracle or career sites is professional. It doesn't take too much to get a professional headshot done. If you're not wanting to go out and hire, you know, a professional person, it's really easy as long as you just have a plain background um, and have a friend come over, snap a photo. Let's be honest, uh, cell phones these days have really improved their capabilities for taking photos. Um, and that kind of goes over to the LinkedIn icon there too. As you're putting together a resume, and we're gonna talk about that more later on, make sure the resume matches what you have on LinkedIn. You might have more kind of colorful information on LinkedIn and maybe even more than what your resume says, which is fine but don't have different you know, end dates for maybe your college or high school years or different careers in general. Just make sure it matches back and forth um, so there's no errors there. Um, spell check. So spell check is one of the simplest ways to make sure your resume or your cover letter or any other items, maybe your 30, 60, 90 that you're sending over to a, a recruiter or a hiring manager to make sure you put your best foot forward. It takes not very long, and it's a simple thing to make sure there's no glaring errors when you send it over. Voicemail. So this has been something where, I don't know about you, but if you're trying to actively get a, a new job or a promotion, you know, there's going to be, especially now during COVID, a lot of virtual communication. And so one thing you want to do is make sure, A, your voicemail is not full, because that's never fun, and B, that your voicemail message is professional, it has key information, um, and it's not one that, again, like you've recorded many, many years ago, um, something to keep in mind as well. All right, so this is something that has actually gone up in recent years. And what you're seeing is we spend or can spend, you know, hours working on a resume, right? Or having other people look at it. And we put a lot of time in it. But right now, recruiters or hiring managers or people who have openings like myself, we're not spending a ton of time looking at every single line on your resume. We're spending on average 7.4 seconds. And on the right is an image of actually um, some companies, because of the amount of resumes they receive, are using you know, resume software that picks apart the resume to see, does it have the right verbiage? Does it have the right style? Is there the right skills involved? And then they rank their candidates that way through technology without even getting into a recruiter's hands. So due to all of this, this is how important it is to take time to look at your resume and make sure it's clear, concise, formatted, easy to read. And we'll get into that next. All right. So on the left here is a resume that I will say I see nine out of 10 times for someone who has recently graduated college or they're in their first one to two years of having a job um, out of college or out of high school. So, and then on the right here is a resume that I see more with professional hires or people who are outside of the workforce for a little bit longer. And so the reason why I wanna pre present these two is you're gonna have multiple different formats of your resume. And the reason why that's important is depending on the different roles that you're applying to, you wanna change these experience setting, like the different headings of the experience and the relevant experience, depending on the job that you're going for. You're gonna highlight different facts. 
For instance, if you're going for a marketing role or a sales role, your verbs you use, the numbers you put in, you're going to highlight different things versus if you're going to be a soccer coach or wanting to go back into nursing or what have you. Um, this is where you're going to do a lot of different changes. So I highly recommend one master resume that is kind of like your go-to and then different versions underneath that one for, you know, the different jobs you could be applying to. What I will say is it's standard to have a one page resume. And I know, for instance, my parents who have been in the workforce for 40 plus years, you know, their resumes are two pages, you know, and that makes sense. They've built up years and years of relevant experience and that's why it's so long. But if we're not in that bucket of having that many years of experience, it is the best, the kind of golden rule is to have a one page resume. On that, um, I wanted to kind of move over to some different examples. So one thing I will say is action verbs um, is really, really important in a resume. I actually hyperlinked this, if we're gonna be sending this out, happy to do that, but hyperlinked it to a really great website which has 185 powerful action verbs. I've listed some underneath in different fonts. And the reason I did that is, so don't get me wrong, I love a good unique font to put in a presentation. But when you're working on a resume, these are not recommended. Um, you want something like in these other examples where it's you know, Times New Roman or Calibra or Arial um, versus something that's a little harder to read or won't even be scanned by the resume grading software. Um, I will say if you are outside of education, so you've either finished high school or college for, and you're outside by about two years, I have always seen and I recommend to my friends and peers that you move your education part to the bottom of your resume, kind of like a how I've done here on the left. Um, I kind of sliced and diced a good friend of mine's resume who I've helped work on. And the reason why is that you have those 7.4 seconds, right? And when you look at the eye tracking technology of what recruiters or what hiring managers or even myself as a manager, what I'm looking at, I'm looking at the top and I'm gonna scan down to the bottom real quick. So I'm gonna be looking at this section over here on the left, which is accomplishments and skills. I'm gonna take a quick, quick glance at your current experience, and then I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom and look at education. Those are you know, really the four, three areas that I focus on in those 7.4 seconds. Um, and the example I have on the right, the reason why I have this there is this is a great, like Katie, whoever Katie is, found this on the internet, I'll be honest, whoever Katie is, She's done a lot. She has a ton of experience. She has a lot of great skills. But what I will say is this resume to me is overwhelming. There is no way I'm going to learn enough about Katie in 7.4 seconds or even a minute because there's just a lot of verbiage on this resume. And so what I recommend too is when you're working on your resume, send it to a friend. Send it to a friend. Have fresh eyes on it. It's so important because when you start working hours on a resume, you're, you're too close to it. You don't see the errors. You don't think clearly or maybe a new idea because you've just spent so much time on it. So I know I have a good friend. I always send mine to if I want an updating or what have you. And that's a way to maybe pare it down and come up with a better format as well. For awards and accomplishments or skills, I personally here on the left, I personally like them having their own sections. The reason why, in my opinion, is because when you put too many of those in the actual experience part, that makes it even more cluttered or busier. And the way, if you can highlight that as one of the first parts, either at the top um, or some I've seen at the bottom, that's a great way for when a recruiter or a hiring manager is looking at it, it's like, wow, they've done a lot. They've achieved, I mean, this person has done basically everything at Oracle, like they have you know, they're a top sales rep, they are an MVP, they're part of, you know, a president, they've taken other initiatives, like that's something they get immediately, versus having to read, you know, I personally don't read every single bullet point. So as a hiring manager, I might miss out on something this person has done, because they haven't been able to highlight it in a different way in their resume. I definitely think depending on your role that you're going for, using data is your friend. 
So using percentages, using ranking, you know, or if you were a sales associate in a store, like how much sales did you bring in? Or were you the number one sales rep? Or, you know, what have you? I think using that kind of data will always have your back and something that recruiters look for. They look for how were you ranked? How are you compared to your peers? Am I hiring the best candidate I can? So that's something else to keep in mind. Um, I want to touch on gaps in employment because I think that is something that's important to talk about. So there, if you have a gap in your employment and you're going back to your resume, you're like, okay, how do I update it? How do I talk that through? One thing that I've talked with friends, family, and seen in other interviews, it's like, that's going to be something that's talked about first off. So make sure you have a pitch ready. Make sure you can explain, you know, why you're away, whether it's starting a family or you, you know, had an illness or whatever it is, just make sure you can talk through it in a concise manner and then move on to what you can bring to the table. The same thing in the resume. Um, I've seen resumes where it lists out the gap of, you know, I was away, you know, you have the title of header and you have the years and you list about you being away whether maybe you're a mother and you're, you had twins and you list that out in the resume, but then you talk about, hey, what else have you done? What can you bring to the table? And I see that as a very valuable asset versus trying to hide a gap because be, lying is the number one thing you should not do on a resume. I will say, you know, you can always fluff in your favor. I tell my reps that. And what I mean by that is you can always round up if, your percentage is 99.1, no one's going to hurt you for rounding up to 100% or rounding up however you want. But don't round from you close 49% or you did something with your stats and you round up to, you know, 100%. That, you can't fluff that far. But don't always, you know, think about the stats of, oh, I got to be exact for that percentage. Um, let's see talk about being honest. And then the last thing I'll mention on these slides is depending on the role you're going through, going for, you can get creative. And what I mean by that is you're going for a social media or marketing or, you know, roles where it makes sense to add a little bit more than your classic um, segmented and formatted resume. This are, there's so many different options out there. I will say I spent a good time, you know, researching different resumes that what I have currently. And there are even resume programs that will build your resume for you. You input the information, they will plug and play all kinds of different formats, like 40 formats, and you can pick the best one that's for you. So going back to that meme of feeling overwhelmed of like, I don't want to do this. No one has time for this. It takes time to come up with the items you're putting in the resume. But there are so many great, you know, Google resume formatters that can help you. So you're not alone in a Word doc trying to get this done. Um, the last thing I will say is that um, one thing when we're going about our day, especially, we're not always going to remember things that we step up to. For instance, if it's a leadership position, a volunteer position, um, helping, coaching someone on our team, or you know, a neighbor through something, I highly recommend starting, this is something my mentor told me, starting a note in your phone. So just keeping a note and just jogging down anytime you do something as, hey, I stepped up and I helped and coached one of my peers through getting, you know, better at sales skills and, or I volunteered for this owl event, you know, whatever it is, and putting that in the note, because then when it comes time to update your resume, you're not like, oh crap, what have I done in the last year? You know, I need to update it. You already have it built in your phone. You're like, oh, perfect. Let me read this and go through it and let me add it into my resume. Because a lot of times when we put that pressure on ourselves to update our resume all at one time, we're going to forget all the cool things we've done throughout the last year or so. Um, I guess last thing, last thing, uh, references. I think that's really important to have references available. Um, to vouch for you, whether it's a separate reference letter or a list of names, contact information. I don't really like when it says references upon request on resume because it should be something that's not 
um, formatted that way, but more as here, I have some great people in my corner who are ready to vouch for me. Um, but side note, make sure they know you're on, they're on your reference list. So if they're getting a phone call or an email, it doesn't catch them off guard. That's all I have. San yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Summer. Um, if you will, I've already gotten some questions about if you yeah. could pass that presentation to me and then um, I will send along to anyone who emails me on the Oracle side and then I'll also forward it to Teal so that she can pass it along to anyone on the Dress for Success side. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Summer. All right, Saba, you're up. All right. Thank you, Summer. I feel like I just learned so much and I definitely need access to that slide deck. So don't forget about me when you're sending it out. <laughs> I will. Um, Hi, everybody. So nice to meet you. Um, thank you for coming today. And I don't want to just say thank you to be cheesy. I know right now it's it's hard to prioritize and maybe sometimes we have more time on our hands than we want and don't know how to delegate it. But I will say the fact that you showed up for yourself and try to better what you're doing and your goals, that's step one. So you made it here and we're happy to have you. Um, I'm going to be covering LinkedIn specifically. Um, for those that know me, I'm all about the social selling, the social networking. I think now more than ever, because we're not necessarily exposed to an office setting and we can't just go to someone's cube and get to know them or have them get to know us, your LinkedIn profile is basically your virtual avatar. It's an extension of yourself. And I think sometimes it may depend on the industry or the line of work you're trying to go into, but what I've seen over the past couple of years is it can be a really powerful platform, not only to build your brand, but also get in touch with people geographically or, you know, through a hierarchy of, let's say you're just an intern right now, but you want to work with a VP or get to know someone. It really does offer a lot of um, potential to get yourself out there and build your brand. So I don't have a deck for you and I'd like this to be more of a dialogue, but a couple of things that I wanna go over, um, I'll, I'll speak to you now. And then I think a really good way to exemplify is for me to just share my LinkedIn profile with you. Cause again, it's kind of my baby. And I think a lot of the things I'll speak to, you can see in my profile. Um, I, would, I know we don't have like a poll set up or anything and, and a lot of you aren't on video, but if you can, put a reaction with a thumbs up. I'm just kind of curious how many of you out there right now have and are utilizing your LinkedIn? All right, I see Piper, Safana, Manisha, Leanne, Lisa, Sean, all right, all right, good, nice. So a lot of us are already using this platform and familiar with it. Now it's kind of a matter of what are you doing and how far are you taking it? So. I liked a lot of what Summer spoke to in terms of making sure your profile, whether it's your resume or your LinkedIn, is professional. And I think sometimes we might misinterpret or misalign professional with personal, but they're both a really important part of getting employers, getting your peers, getting people that are your mentors to really understand you and add a little bit of color to how you can be an asset to the company or that organization. So of course it's really important on your LinkedIn. I think people just kind of see it as, okay, it's, my, it's a version of my resume. Yeah, it is. And you're gonna put your experience and your education, but there's so much more to you and what you have to offer than the jobs that you've had or the school that you went to, right? So that's why you can use, there's a summary portion. What is your about me? What is your story? I think, a lot of times, again, I'm more in the sales industry. So when I'm talking to my reps or I'm talking to other people, I always like to mention everything is a story. But regardless of what field you're in, don't forget that how you've gotten to where you are is a story. And so it's kind of up to you to narrate that and, and make it powerful. And I'll, I'll show you the example from my summary in a little bit. But that about portion, it should include, you know, any skills that you have or any like Summer was saying, if you stepped up to help on a team or you are part of a project, you could speak to that and put that in there. If you're part of a volunteer group, speak to that and put that in there. It says something about you and, and what you're spending your time doing. For example, when I was in college, I volunteered at a food bank. And volunteering at that food bank taught me a lot about communication, organization, even negotiation. So 
you can apply that to a lot of things that maybe you might not even have considered. I think another really important thing to consider with LinkedIn is it's not just a platform for showing your profile, but you really have an opportunity to engage with your peers and your network by sharing content. That can be you publishing an article yourself. For me, I'm really passionate about writing and it's kind of how I process what's going on at my job, what I'm doing. So I remember upon my one year anniversary of my job out of college, I said, hey, you know, I've seen a lot of things and I think this would be really helpful for other people who are joining the workforce out of college or who are joining a, a big company and don't really know what's important. So I made an article called the four keys to success, you know, one year post college, one year anniversary. And it ended up getting, I feel like it opened doors for me in terms of who I connected with, getting visibility throughout my organization. And more importantly, guys, like it really is all about paying it forward. So I think sometimes we don't even realize how just a small piece of content or our experience that we share it makes a really big difference in helping out others that are in the same situation as you or maybe one or two years behind where you're at. And it just kind of really helps expand your network. Um, and again, I'll review this with you when I share my screen. I probably could have done a little bit better of a job of preparing that beautiful deck that Summer prepared, but we can do that next time. Um, but I think, you know, the most important thing I want to get across to you guys that has been really helpful for me and it took me some time to embrace because it's not easy to you know, share stories or be vulnerable and, and write an article or even share, share an article that wasn't published by you and say, hey, what are your thoughts? It's really important to be confident. And again, just understand that it's not a bad thing to share. It's not a bad thing to ask your network for advice, ask them for their opinion. Most of the people wanna be doing that and for whatever reason, you know, they don't have the time or they're more shy. It's really important to put yourself out there. And again, you can be professional while also making things personal and adding a little bit of color to who you are and what you speak to. So without further ado, I think what I'm gonna do is share my screen and walk you guys through my profile. So can you see my screen? Somebody give me a, a thumbs up. We're right. good. Awesome. So, I'm very into the personalization. You will, you will see that even just from this little headline. Um, I think, if, again, it's the little touches. So don't be afraid to make it colorful. I use Canva. For anyone that's not familiar, it's uh, C-A-N-V-A dot com. It's a free tool where you can create, I think, even a resume. Um, you can create posters, flyers. You know, let's say you want to build a webinar of your own someday. You can use that. As to what Summer was speaking to you about the picture, I literally invited my friend over this was a year or two ago and stood against the white wall she got her cell phone out i wore this red blazer because oracle is known for you know the big red so i wanted to add a little bit of flair and and that's how i got this picture so it's a lot more easy than you might think like don't overthink it you don't need a lot just put on a blazer get a nice picture you're good to go so of course you know yeah we have the education here where we work my about i think is my favorite part of my profile, um, again, we want to go back to the story and it doesn't necessarily just have to be, you know, Saba has five years of experience in sales and business. That's cool too, but what'll be even more powerful. And I tell you this because I literally had someone slack me two hours ago and they were like, wow, Grizzly Peak, that's awesome. So you'd be surprised how far things can travel, but this is just a little story about what I do and, and more importantly, what I put into it, right? So when I was 21, I climbed Grizzly Peak. I'm not a hiker at all, not the most athletic, sorry to admit it, but I really, it was kind of an epiphany moment for me. So when I was on this hike, trust me, I wanted to quit, just like how, to be honest with you, some days in my job or in during my job search, of course I wanted to get up and quit. But despite, you know, like I said here, the high winds, the low altitude, whatever it is that's, that's a challenge for you, I kept going. And I, I think that's kind of powerful. You know, I'm that person. Once I say I'll do something, it'll happen. And then it's going to lead into, okay, well, what do you do? What experience do you have? All right, well, now I'm putting that perseverance to work as a sales manager. I don't have to climb any mountains, but I do have to move them. Then we get into the experience, right? So business and leadership oriented professional with a passion for technology. What have you done? And then I think, you know, small things, guys, like, again, making yourself available, making yourself open to networking. 
put that in there. Don't be afraid. Hey, if you're interested in grabbing coffee and talking business, or you want to hear about how I almost fell off this 1200 foot mountain, send an email my way, reach out to me, make yourself available and people will do the same to you. Right? So, you know, that's an example of making a short, but sweet summary and making it personal, but also making it professional. Um, LinkedIn has a couple of really cool features that I think every couple months they come out with. And one of them that I really like is the featured uh, area. So for those of you that are interested in sharing content or speaking to your experience or even challenges you're having, which I really like to do, you know, if you're having a work anniversary, write something about it. Personally, what I've been getting really into, and I think it's a result of the state of the world right now, is mindfulness in the workplace. Uh, especially in a career path that is very competitive and it is very results oriented. So I decided to do a little bit of research, write a quick article on managing stress and, and share it with my network and kind of see, you know, what responses we're getting there. So the featured page is a really good um, ability for you to showcase any specific content you've shared or any post that you've done where if a recruiter or your friend or your boss is, you know, potential boss is going through your profile, they're going to say, okay, cool. So this is a highlight of everything she's been up to in the past. Now, just kind of covering um, the experience portion. Again, it's similar to a resume, except over here, I think you can make it even a little bit more colorful. So for me, what I like to do is instead of just posting, you know, these are my responsibilities, tie it back to a story. How have all these experiences gotten you to where you are now? And what does it mean, right? So I've only been in my recent job for about two months. I don't have a ton of results to speak to. But if you look below, you know, in my previous role, I wrote here a, one or two sentences about what I do, where it all came full circle. So for me, you know, leadership has been a really big part of what I want to do. And I want to make sure to speak to that when people are looking at my profile. Of course, we put a couple results in here. Numbers are always important. And what I love and what may, maybe you haven't um, utilized up to this point is for every job, um, for every experience that you have, you can add pictures, PDFs, videos, hyperlinks to kind of give that person a better idea of what it is you did and what you covered. So, you know, for me here, I really am passionate about my team. So, of course, I forced them to do a photo shoot with me. And you know, there you go. I shared a picture of who my team is. If someone's wondering, okay, what does she do and who does she work with? That's an example right there. Or, you know, for me, accolades are something that maybe it feeds the ego a little bit if we're being honest, but I think it also is a great opportunity to show people what you've accomplished. So, you know, if you've got a plaque or someone celebrates you with something, go ahead and share that. There's, I think a lot of times people are shy or they want to be really humble. And of course, it's, that's a great, quality to have being humble but it's also really important to build yourself up and you know if you have been celebrated for something don't be afraid to share that with your network because you're the only person that can kind of advertise yourself and advertise what an asset you could be so don't be afraid to do that um, just some other examples below right so for every post try to put some results that you generated or ways that you went out of the job description so for me when I was a sales rep I was really into Toastmasters, which I would recommend to every single one of you. It's a public speaking organization where a lot of times it's provided through your employer or even I know people would meet at the park, churches, anywhere. Google it, Toastmasters. It's helped me profoundly in increasing my communication skills and just kind of it's really important to be aware of how you speak. And I don't know if you guys realize how many filler words we probably all use when we're speaking. So that's another part of increasing your communication skills. Um, yeah, so these are just some examples here. I think the last thing I wanna cover, and then I'm you know, happy to take any questions that you guys have. But so of course, you know, any certifications you have, go ahead and add in there. Volunteer experience, it's pretty big. Don't, don't diminish little things that you do. They all add up to something. Um, endorsements, a really great way to get endorsements is to give endorsements, right? The law of attraction, what you put out there will be reciprocated. Um, so go ahead and endorse your friends, endorse your network. And a lot of times the great thing about LinkedIn and their you know, AI or whatever you wanna call it is 
when you get endorsed, a lot of times it'll just come up with a message right there that you can send to your friend, hey, thanks for endorsing me. Or you endorse someone, they'll say thanks for endorsing me for public speaking. You, re you respond and say, hey, no problem. I'd really appreciate if you could endorse me for sales and business development. Be specific about what you need. And I think it's a really great way to kind of brush up your credibility so that maybe someone who doesn't know you or it's someone who knows someone that knows you can go and see, okay, well, this is pretty legit. Um, you know, once you get to 99 plus, I feel like that's a really big deal. So anyone on this uh, webinar who wants to endorse me for leadership, I promise you, whatever you endorse me for, I'll endorse you right back. Um, the last thing here, guys, I think is really, really important, speaking to Summer and how she was talking about references. And instead of just saying references available upon request, okay, well, not everyone's going to take the step to go ahead and request your references. So why don't you go ahead and offer it to them so they don't have to ask? I think recommendations are super, super important. And whether or not you have, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 years of experience or you work with a plethora of people, all it takes is one or two strong recommendations of someone who's known you, someone who's seen your ability, your hunger, your passion. Uh, there's a lot of really good templates out there you can work with and then plug things into. But again, don't be afraid to ask for a recommendation. I had to ask my mentors, people that I worked for, people that I worked with. And I think it really does kind of help to, again, build that story and build your credibility as to who you are and what you do and how, again, it's all about how you set yourself apart from the rest. So these little things can make a difference. Um, I'm going to look at the chat really quickly right now because I see a couple things coming in here. Or uh, Sandy, do you think I should just wait until the end? That's because we're running on time. You can feel free to respond in the chat, Saba. That'd be okay. great if you could. But then, yeah, that gives Roxy plenty of time and then we can wrap up. Okay, awesome. So awesome. hopefully what you found was helpful. The last thing, and I know I keep saying that, but the last thing is don't be afraid to send connections, connect requests on LinkedIn to people that might be outside of your network. There's a really big difference between sending 50 automatic ones and sending a personal connect request. So please don't go and bombard a bunch of strangers with, I'd like to add you to my personal network. Instead, hi, I'm Saba. I see you are a vice president at Comscope. What I, this is a line I use all the time. It works nine out of 10 times. I see no reason we shouldn't connect and then put connect in little air quotes. Um, just be personal. If there's one thing you can take away from what I'm sharing with you, it's be personal, create your brand and tell a story. And um, all of you are more than welcome to please add me on LinkedIn. I love expanding my network. I will endorse you. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Saba. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Roxy, if you're ready, go for it. Okay, I have some big shoes to fill after those two <laughs> great things. So um, Summer and Saba game came from such a great kind of being in the business, reviewing people, actually making, especially Summer, making those hiring decisions. So I'm more on the front end of this process, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a recruiter, so I might sometimes be the first person you've ever spoken to at a company. Um, some people like to say gatekeeper, right? We're the middleman between both the candidate and the company and the hiring managers. So I'm just kind of go, going to go over some of my experiences after eight years of reading evaluations, hearing manager feedback, the do's and the don'ts, the really bads and the really great so that we can make sure that you guys are the best candidate um, for any role, any industry. This is not going to be tapered just to Oracle. When I go on campus, I give a brief introduction to Oracle and obviously talk about the great roles we offer. But that's not what I want candidates to think about after I'm done speaking. I want them to think like, wow, I've never heard that before. Wow, that's really nice that someone actually shared that. Because I think, um, in at least in the recruiting process, there's a lot of mixed messages. Um, everything from what your parents are telling you, which probably doesn't still stand the same from when they were you know, uh, going through interview process 20, 30, 40 years ago. A lot has changed, right? And then on, on top of that, you have your peers, you have um, whether it might be career counselors. So how, you know, how do you actually take everything like that and make sure that um, you're not overwhelming yourself with information? It can kind of become information overload. So I'm going to do my best here um, to really summarize that and really at the end of the day, hope um, to empower everyone to use their personal stories 
um, to your advantage in the recruiting process. So we're going to make this a mix of both professional and personal. So Summer totally spoke my love language with everything when it came to resumes. I was like, yes, yes, yes. Um, so like she said, uh, professional email address, that one you had in there kind of cracked me up, but that is um, surprisingly very common. So just a really your name, your first and last name in a Gmail, so easy to do or Yahoo, right? Um, one thing also that helps me get back to candidates really quickly is if in um, if you embed a signature into your um, emails when you're saying so you have your first and your last name, your phone number that you can be reached at, and um, the hyperlink to your LinkedIn profile. So right when I get that email, I can see, okay, here's their phone number right here. Oh, let me just click their LinkedIn. It's already right there as opposed to the recruiter. So anything you can do to minimize time, right? Like Summer said, we spend an average of seven and a half seconds looking at resume. So why not speed up that process so I can just get to that information that much quicker? Um, and one thing I've always kind of even taken this advice, and I want to um, share this always in your emails with a question. Um, as long as it's not like a thank you email and you're thanking someone for their time, even that, it's a lot harder for someone to disregard or ignore an email when someone's asking a question. It's kind of human nature to want to respond to someone. Um, so ask, asking a next step, asking an action item, asking someone to spend five minutes just chatting with you about your experiences. So I really think it's important to follow up every email with a question. Um, resumes, like she said, PDF, everything. There's a ton of free resources that just convert it. Uh, I use an app called JotNot Pro. Um, I'll send that in the chat, but I, it, it, it can put anything into a PDF, even on your phone. Um, and then also how you save your resume is really, really important. Um, because my favorite is when I see Sarah Smith, uh, IBM, right? So that clearly was a resume that she was sending off to another company. So it's like little things like that. All you really simply need, first, last name, resume, and that's it. Don't try and put the month, don't put anything like that. All the, the simpler, the better when you're, when it comes to the resume. One page and one page only. Honestly, especially as a recruiter, um, that seven and a half second thing, I mean, that goes by really quick, right? So I hopefully want to be able to learn everything I can learn about you that I need to know um, just from that first page. I rarely, I know that in kind of, a, if we got a stapled resume, it would kind of be like, okay, let me grab the first page. So you really want to make sure your most important things that you want the recruiter or the company to know about you um, are, are put into a one page format. Um, objectives. These can either really hurt you or they can really help you. Um, so I would keep them as general as possible unless you know that you have the time and the effort to curate each objective to each role and company you're hiring for, right? So if I get a resume from a candidate applying to a sales role within the technology industry, if I see that you're looking for a marketing role in the retail industry in your objective, it's kind of, um, it's sending a mixed message, right? So as opposed to having um, a very specific objective, make this more of a summary about yourself um, so that it doesn't come back to hurt you in the long run. Because so quickly, especially, I think some of, sometimes we get on those adrenaline kicks and you're sending off your resumes, you're sending off emails, you're firing off these emails. You know, I get called Sarah, Jessica, Lisa, all these names, because the person simply forgot to change the name of the recruiter that they were emailing, right? So let's really kind of, um, you know, it's, it's okay to take a few seconds back between emails, making sure you're, you're sent, you know, addressing it to the right person um, and such. So cover letters, I get this question a lot. Um, I think this is another situation where it can hurt you or help you. Um, because cover letters can be so specific, right? Um, my rule of thumb, unless a recruiter or a company is requesting it, I, I don't include it. Um, if you feel really comfortable with your writing skills, if you definitely have a story um, that you want to tell, um, it definitely shouldn't be a novel. I would think no, no more than kind of three short paragraphs when it comes to a cover letter. Um, but like we said, going back to the essence of time, um, in this day and age, we're looking at the resume because it's been sent and it's required, but we're really focusing on the LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn profile um, is the number one media used by recruiters for the job search. So 
LinkedIn, LinkedIn, everything. Um, if you're not familiar, there's a term called Boolean searches. So this is what recruiters use to pick up profiles for the job that they're trying to actively hire for, right? So in terms of also personalizing your summaries on your LinkedIn profiles, we wanna make sure you're putting those key words in there, our buzzwords, as you might say, right? So if you were to go look at my LinkedIn, you're gonna see time management, public speaking, uh, event planning, because if someone is looking for a recruiter with all of these, they are gonna use the Boolean search to find those keywords on someone's profile. So my profile there is gonna move up the rankings, right? So on top of having a personal summary about yourself, make sure you're highlighting those keywords on your LinkedIn profile as well. Um, and even something as small as your correct location um, on your LinkedIn profile, make sure that you are putting the city that you're in and want to work in, or if you plan on moving, update that location as well, because recruiters are automatically typing the location of the city um, that they're trying to hire that role into. So even those minute details are really important because the recruiters are, are, are coming across thousands of LinkedIn profiles, so all the better that yours can jump up um, the list for what they're actually looking for. Um, in this virtual day and age, we are learning etiquette we've never had to learn before when it comes to video chat, um, Zoom meetings, Skype meetings, conference calls. This is all, although the phone has always been around, I think it is, it's a different landscape now. Um, my manager has always encouraged us to be five minutes early to a call and that has definitely never hurt. If you're on time, you're late kind of thing. So when you, um, are let's say getting a Zoom invite or a Skype invite to an interview, it's okay to show up five, 10 minutes early um, because you know what? I get that email notification that so-and-so is waiting in my room, waiting for their screening. And I, I think that's great. You know, um, you know, obviously if you're having technical difficulties, if something's going on, all the better that you got that out of the way early on, right? Like, hey, I just tried dialing to Zoom. Um, my keyboard isn't working or my microphone isn't working. Let's, let's figure that out before the actual interview time starts. So my rule of thumb is, you know, five to eight minutes early, definitely dial into a call so that you can um, avoid any technical issues. So um, if the interviewer is calling you, answer with your name. This sounds kind of um, interesting, but every interviewer I've ever spoken to um, they say that it, it, um, it makes a great first impression from a phone when you say, hi, this is Roxy Wolf, um, so that A, they make sure that they're pronouncing your name properly. Um, it kind of starts it off on a professional note, just being like, hey, what's up, right? We have to make sure that we're remembering the setting that um, we're in. And it's, it's, it's not as easy to make a first impression over the phone, but just by answering a professional manner, um, you've already started the call off on a great note. Um, I highly encourage stalking in the most professional way possible. Um, this is what LinkedIn's for, right? I, I love when I'm about to go screen a candidate and they've already looked at my profile. They saw where I went to school. They saw where I went. They've Googled me. They know where I live. I don't think that's creepy at all. As recruiters, I think we're kind of professional stalkers in a, in a very, um, professional setting, but my managers, when I'm reading that feedback after the interview, they love that the person knew how long they had been at Oracle. Oh, I saw you got promoted after one year. How did you, how did you get to that point, right? Um, so, and if you don't have the names of your interviewers, that's what we as recruiters are here for. Let us be this guide. Let us be a resource. Um, I want you as a candidate to ask me who you're talking to. What's their name? Can you spell that for me? Can you send in the email after we talk? Um, especially asking for email, nobody's in an office right now. So there's no such thing in a sense of sending a thank you letter. And I think timing is of the essence with, with everything. So get the email of the person that you're going to be speaking with either from the recruiter or from that person interviewing you and fire off that thank you email. Um, as soon as you're done, you know, 
thank them for their time, include a personal antidote of something that you spoke about because it's never going to hurt you. And I think you'd be surprised by how many people don't do that. And it's all that much more going to set you apart from the other candidates who are going through the process. So, um, so only interview for the job you want, which sounds confusing, but it really is so matter of fact. Um, if I'm interviewing a candidate for a sales role and then they start asking about marketing and public relations, red flags right away, right? You know, it's one thing to get your feet wet, to get the practice, but let's use our family members. Let's utilize a network. Let's find someone on LinkedIn that is passionate about recruiting and coaching and mentoring, right? Um, I totally think, you know, as a recruiter, I have respect for other recruiters and their time. I'm only going to truly interview for a job that if I did receive an offer, I would seriously consider accepting it. And the recruiters are going to pick up on that. If you're saying, I don't really know what I want to do yet, or I'm kind of trying to figure it out. By that point, there might be someone that they just talked to before you or after you that said, this is exactly what I want. This is where I want to be. And that kind of also bleeds into transparency. Um, you know, I think the go-getters and the people who are completely visible with uh, this is where I want to go. This is the kind of job I want to do. We as recruiters, we as hiring managers, we want to know that because then that takes some of the, the, the guessing game and the assumptions away from us because you, you completely laid out that this is something you want to do. Um, show yourself, show your personality, but don't become too comfortable. And what I mean by that is start using slang or using cuss words. I mean, that sounds kind of crazy, but I've gotten numerous feedback and uh, evaluations from students who just kind of put their feet up and they got a little too comfortable. I mean, it's so great to let this manager see who you are as a person, your personality. You're talking about your favorite music, your favorite food, your favorite podcast. I love neutral subjects like that. Um, but let's not get too, too comfortable, even though all of a sudden you realize they know your brother or they know your cousin, you know, still keep this professional because at the end of the day, they're filling out a professional feedback form for you. And it's on their, on them when they pass you through, right? So even though they might've felt really comfortable with you, they still know they've got to send you to their boss and possibly their boss's boss, right? So half of your personality, but also keeping it professional at the same time. Um, kind of understanding the rule of the recruiter, right? Very rarely, if at all, do we make the final hiring decision, but we definitely play a key role in your hiring process. Like I said, we're your resource, we're kind of your, your, your guide, you know, we're here to answer questions. Um, I think it's really, really important to ask for timelines. I like to know when, what, where, so I'm not waiting by the phone, I'm not refreshing my email box every 10 minutes. I wanna know, okay, you guys are talking to me today, when do you guys wanna hire someone? Um, I like asking, are you looking at people internally? I, I can't ask who my competition is, but I kind of want to get a feel for it. Um, those are really great questions to ask for the recruiter. If they can't answer it, they'll tell you that, but all the better to ask, you know. Um, you know, your resume is a list of your accomplishments. Um, and more times than not, your hiring managers and the people interviewing you are going to, um, you know, have a good idea of that. So use the time you're speaking with someone to help them learn something about you that they can't learn from your resume, that they can't learn from your LinkedIn. And I've been speaking to a lot of hiring managers this summer as we're developing our interview process. And the word grit has come up a lot. You know, it's very natural to speak to your successes, which is very important, but I love learning about people's failures. I want to know of a time that you didn't succeed. You know, what, what did that look like for you? How did you overcome it? Because from, from rejection and failure comes resilience. And those are skills, those are life skills that cannot be taught in a college classroom. If you worked in a restaurant, put that on your resume. I want to know that. I've been interviewing candidates and they tell me they're, they've been a waiter. I'm like, well, where is that on your resume? I was like, that's one of the, the most difficult jobs you could have retail. You know, we, we want to learn your story. And the more you can professionally develop your narrative around what you've been through and 
what, what it's made you the person today and why it's going to make you the best candidate for this role. Um, that's what our hiring managers want to learn. And um, I know that we're kind of running a little low on time, but you know, recruiting is a two way road. Um, we all need jobs. We all have to pay our bills. We all have a life we're trying to sustain, but make sure you're using your time wisely and you're not putting all your effort into a company that maybe just doesn't feel right for you, right? Um, you should be interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you because you spend more time at work than you sometimes do with your own personal life, family, and friends. So is this going to be a place that you want to be and you want to spend that time and effort so that six months down the road, um, you're not looking for a new place to go, right? So does this company have the same values as you? You know, I look at Oracle and I look at this Zoom room today. And I'm like, how cool is it that we have a room full of people that are here to learn and want to give the best advice possible? That's a company I want to work for because we don't just post about it um, on LinkedIn. We actually do it. So, you know, we have resources like this in Oracle because people need them. They want them. They've asked for them. And that's a company that holds my values. Um, I, I play a very important role in this company in a sense that I'm going on campus. I might be the first person that they've ever talked to from Oracle. And I have a rule of thumb with my recruiting job. I would never recruit from a company I wouldn't let my sister work at. And that has held true for five and a half years because um, I truly believe the message that we're talking about on campus is what holds true here. So I hope that you guys feel as you're going through this interview process and the people you're speaking to that you feel good after these conversations, you've learned something, you feel empowered. I have, I've had those disastrous interviews where I did, did not feel good about myself after. And I was like, is this really a place I'd wanna be if this is the kind of conversation I had, if, if this is how I felt after. Um, and really just to summarize it up, guys, you know, when you are answering questions, um, we've really been speaking to the STAR method. Um, I'll include this in my notes, but if you guys Google the STAR method, this is going to help you rock every interview you go to. It's going to help that rambling and kind of going on. It's going to show these interviews that you um, had a situation, you created a task, you had an action, and you had a result. So kind of taking all this stuff, like I said, I was kind of summarizing everything we've talked about today, but if you guys can research one thing, it's answering, you know, your questions in the STAR format, but um, I'll be happy to kind of send um, all my notes I had today to Sandy and put that in a PDF to send out to everyone. But I want to give it back to time because I know we're right at one. Perfect. Thank you so, so much. Um, Roxy, Saba, Summer, I'm not sure how much time you have left in case if you have a few little minutes to spare for some Q&A at the end of this. Um, so but other than that, thank you all so much for attending. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to stay on. I'll keep my Zoom up for a bit um, just so that you can ask questions. I know we ran over time. But again, thank you all so much. Thanks, Teal, for making this happen. Um, great.